Great. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project, and welcome to our session today on Practicing Excellence, Team Building, Part 1 of a two-part series. So before we get going, I wanted to let you know that um, people can receive um, one hour of credit for CME. After the session, you'll receive a CME survey if you can complete that. And then we have a partnership with the UCLA Continuing Medical Education Department, and you will receive a certificate after the end of the year. They end up batching all of our MAVEN Project uh, CMEs. And so you'll get that certificate after the end of this year. Um, later today or tomorrow, I'll be sending you Dr. Beeson's slides. And then also a recording of today's session will be available on our MAVEN Project YouTube channel. Um, and that should be within two weeks. Um, and I'll also send you the link so you can kind of check back for that. And please feel free to share that with your colleagues, your staffers who may not have been able to make it today. As always, we welcome your questions and you can put that um, in the chat box on the side and Dr. Beeson will um, facil you know, uh, facilitate questions at the end and possibly even during the session. So I'd like to tell you about Dr. Beeson. It really is a pleasure to have him here and a big thank you to our MAVEN Project volunteers who have worked with him in the past who brought him to my attention. And um, so Dr. Stephen Beeson is a nationally recognized author, physician, and speaker who has provided approaches for developing clinicians and leadership for hundreds of medical groups and hospitals across the country to transform care for patients and those providing care. A board certified family medicine physician, Dr. Beeson practiced with the Sharp Reese Steely Medical Group in San Diego for 18 years. During his tenure with the medical group, Dr. Beeson was selected by Sharp Healthcare Leadership to serve as the physician director for the Sharp Experience and organizational commitment to service and operational excellence. Dr. Beeson's first book, Practicing Excellence, A Physician's Manual to Exceptional Healthcare, became a national bestseller that articulates a prescriptive how-to approach to improve physician performance to drive organizational success. In 2009, he released his second book, Engaging Physicians, a Manual to Physician Partnership. Most recently, Dr. Beeson founded the Clinician Experience Project at practicingexcellence.com. The Clinician Experience Project is an app-based learning community with thousands of clinicians and leaders focused on restoring the clinician experience through reconnecting to patients in the exam room, collaborating as teams to build community and leading in a way to bring the very best from our care teams. Welcome Dr. Beeson, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. yes. Great, great. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here and you know, I've really fallen in love with the work that you're doing, uh, getting to know the folks and the people and the spirit of the Maven Project. So it's, uh, I'm delighted to help in, in any way I can. Um, Susan, uh, like a Johnson and I go way back and delighted to re-intersect and help to make healthcare better uh, for, your, for your work and certainly the communities and patients that you serve. Uh, and, and to fill in a little bit, uh, Jill's uh, bio, uh, of me, my my heart and soul is in the exam room, uh, and and have spent the majority of my life knee to knee with patients uh, as a family medicine physician. And uh, as you had pointed out, I, I had I was tapped in the shoulder about seven years into my career to to become director of an organizational change effort uh, in a group that was uh, struggling financially, struggling culturally, struggling from the patient experience and very high physician attrition. And uh, the task was to, to coach and develop clinicians uh, and to engage them uh, in the effort uh, and to exercise discretionary effort to actually participate in what we're trying to do and become as, as a medical group. And I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing or how to do it. So really became a student of what prompts clinicians to exercise effort to achieve something and what prompts clinicians to exercise their influence to make the people around them better. I, and really learned some critical things um, along the way. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that you know, clinicians desperately seek uh, to become the clinician that they aspire to be, uh, where to, to make massive impact in the lives of patients, to be deeply collaborative as a member of an amazing team and, and to lead their teams in a way that uh, the team soars and provides an amazing care in a really vibrant work environment. 
you know, there's no clinician that finishes their training and says, you know, 20 years from now, I want to be super cynical and depressed, <laughs> you know? And, you know, so what clinicians seek is what exactly what we need clinicians to be. Uh, also learn that uh, coaching works. Uh, we had about a 90% response rate to coaching clinicians uh, in regards to provisioning simple team collaboration, patient connectivity and leadership skills. Uh, and what we found is that there was objective improvement of how patients saw care, but really what we saw was the, the vibrancy and the enthusiasm of clinicians who were seeing the benefit of doing things differently in the exam room and with their teammates, uh, is that we saw real restoration. And subsequent to then, we have demonstrated in uh, controlled studies published with Northwell Health uh, that the intervention of coaching and developing clinicians has all domain significant improvement on patient experience, but it had the secondary outcome of developing clinicians was uh, even a greater impact on Maslow uh, reduction or burnout reduction. Uh, so coaching works. Uh, also learned that um, clinicians never really learn the basic things of leading teams, of building highly collaborative teams, uh, facilitating patient participation and care, reducing authority gradients, uh, patient rapport, empathy with patients, identifying what patients are most afraid of. And uh, those are vital skills. And there's just massive variance in regards to what clinicians do in the exam room. Uh, and having shadowed now over 800 clinicians over the years, I've seen profound variance of what clinicians do, even with the positive bias of a coach being in the exam room, because I can assure you that they're trying their hardest <laughs> when, you know, when we're, we're, when we're watching. So you know, th this idea of coaching and developing clinicians uh, to, to become their best and to do so in a way that allows them to love their work has really become a life journey for me. I, uh, and, I, uh, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit about, you know, how do we leverage clinician influence to build, uh, amazing teams, but, but ultimately the, the making of clinicians who, who both love what they do, uh, while massively contributing to better care, because, uh, th those are like two strands of DNA by doing things that massively make an impact, we harvest the human experiences that prompt us to say, man, that was a good day. <laughs> and you know, when I ask clinicians, tell me about your best day you've ever had, uh, the best, the thing that's etched in your memory is the, is the most cherished moment in healthcare. It's always about impact and relationships. And I was in that moment who I always aspired to be. And by coaching and developing clinicians, we allow those things to manifest. Uh, and, and so here we're going to talk a little bit about um, how do we coach clinicians and what do we observe and really high performing teams. Uh, and we're going to get into prescriptive behaviors in our part two session uh, in March. Uh, but this part one session is what do we see as the, 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 the culture code of great teams? What do they do for one another? And what's consistently present if you were to biopsy a team that says, man, I love my tribe. Uh, and we're gonna look at four of those things and, and really what they do. Before we go there, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of where we are right now and acknowledge that medicine is hard as heck right now. Uh, and, 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 to, and to sort of pose this, this question to you, is being a clinician what you thought it was gonna be? You know, is, you know, we had this expectation, this thing that prompted us to say, I'm going to sacrifice my entire youth <laughs> to, to become something. You know, it's this perpetual delayed gratification from high school to college to, to getting to medical school to part one to part two and residency. And then the real work begins, you know, taking care of patients as an attending physician. And, you know, after that, life of habitual delayed gratification, is it what you thought? You know, and if not, what are we gonna do about it? And, and again, before the pandemic, before the pandemic, there was a public health crisis, is a public health crisis regarding uh, what, what clinicians are going through and the pandemic of, of burnout. And we've all seen this before. I'm not gonna reiterate um, what we all know, which is, which is burnout is a significant issue. I, and I have come to learn uh, with, with certainty and good evidence backing us now 
that in order for organizations to become great, the people who provide care uh, have to be at their best. And if you look at the composite of burnout symptoms, which is you know exhaustion, depersonalization, um, uh, cynicism, you, you can't take that cohort, that inoculum and drop it into the healthcare delivery apparatus and expect that thing to do anything but flail. We have to not only provide extraordinary care to patients in the exam room, so the patient walks out and says, I'm gonna actively participate in this treatment course with a clinician that I know cares about me, I have confidence in them and they really listen to me and I'm a part of the plan. We've gotta be able to do that, but outside of that exam room, we are the team leader and how we perform impacts everybody else. In fact, uh, we had done some work with Kaiser Permanente in Colorado, Colorado Permanente Medical Group. And uh, they had shown, looking at the performance of top decile clinicians and bottom decile clinicians, and then recording patient perception of care and all other non-clinician experiences from registration to access to staff to nursing, everything else. And what they found was profound correlation <laughs> between what the clinicians, where the clinicians landed and where the staff landed. Is it cause and effect? Is it cope? Is, is it correlation? We don't know. But as the clinician goes, so goes the group. So clinicians who are passionate, who coach, who model, who encourage, who appreciate and leverage their influence to be a beacon of light in the clinical microsystem environment is a vital capacity to great performing teams. You, you bring a clinician who's depressed, irritable, negative, and fixed mindset, that team is going to adopt those behaviors. Our behaviors are immensely contagious. So one of the things about creating great performing teams is setting conditions where, where burnout is less likely to happen. Uh, beyond the scope of today necessarily, but I can tell you that uh, that about 80% of the probability of burnout is the environment that the clinicians are immersed in. When clinicians say they care about me here, uh, my voice is heard here, here I'm allowed to become the kind of clinician that I always aspired to be. Here we're unified regarding a higher cause that syncs with my belief system of what's best and right for patients. Here, they listen and respond to the things that I need to be able to provide efficient care. You get clinicians that are having those kind of sentiments, they're gonna say, I'm gonna do everything I can to help this place succeed because this place is awesome. And so us as leaders, we have to set organizational conditions, the soil by which great clinicians rise from. And, and, and this is the pathway to physician engagement. So how do we create a physician burnout reduction is setting conditions where physicians feel valued, listened to, burdened out of the way, voices heard, and those, those conditions. Again, beyond the scope of today, but just to give you a little peek around the corner regarding how do we in a meaningful way uh, create uh, engagement of our clinicians, because it, it's a big deal. Uh, not only is it a dependency for the kind of teams that we wanna create and the kind of culture that we wanna create, uh, but we just simply, the, the numbers of things that happen to clinicians when they're burned out, you know, in terms of error, cost, uh, their, their probability of being in the bottom decile for patient experience is 5x higher if they're experiencing burnout. So, you know, all the things that, that we need from clinicians are all taken away in the context of experiencing burnout. And again, a, a 1 million American patients last year estimated to have lost a clinician due to clinician suicide. I mean, it's, it's hard to even imagine this beautiful profession that is the top 3% of all earners, virtually no unemployment, 20, 25 times a day to make a meaningful impact in our fellow human, uh, societally respected, the mastery of diagnosing and treating disease and lifelong learning. I mean, we look really good on paper. And how is it that we've created experiences where this is happening? So, you know, this is the, the, the context of, that we need in regards to, you know, how do we create high-performing teams? It, we, we must begin with setting organizational conditions where we work, where the clinicians say on Sunday night, man, I'm pumped to go to work tomorrow. Man, I love my team. I love who we are. I love our leadership team. And we're doing some really great, great innovations. And I'm super proud of our crew. You know, that, that's the kind of sentiment and the culture we want to be able to create. 
to allow clinicians to then step into a team leader role to be able to make their team soar, okay? Because it is, uh, this is our life. And, and what we've done is we've habitually delayed gratification. We can't look back at the end of this run, whenever it may be and say, man, I wish I would have done something else. I mean, what greater tragedy is there than that? This beautiful profession where I would contend we have full dominion over all the things that enrich the clinician experience, which is impacting the lives of patients by crushing it behind the exam room door, by collaborating with each other like a small unit and tribe and family who takes care of one another, and leaders who set the soil to allow teams to become their best. By connecting, by collaborating, by leading, we can create this. We, and we have, there, there's no CMS thing or payer circumstance that removes our ability to access really effective leadership, highly collaborative teams that take care of one another, and what we do inside that exam room. We own those things. So part of this is about empowerment. Let's go, let's do this as opposed to, you know, all the <laughs> fixed mindset. You know, it, 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 we, th th there's so many things in healthcare to complain about that if we take that stance, we'll do nothing but sit in the back seat, cross our arms, kick the ground and spew cynicism. And we're victims of everywhere. And I guarantee you nothing's changing in that circumstance. And so as we, as we look about, you know, what are the, you know, the big drivers of human contentment, what are the things that make people say, man, love my life. <laughs> and there's three big drivers of human contentment uh, that prompt people to say, this life is good. And they're profoundly impactful on, on us as, as clinicians and immensely relevant. And so as we think about how do we build really amazing teams, it's, it's about how do we build contentment in our lives? Because we have to be content in our lives for us to be team leaders in a compelling and effective way. So three big drivers of, of human contentment. And this is transcendent for cultures, uh, time, professions. These are, these are, these are fairly transcendent uh, dynamics. Number one is mastery, our ability to advance, accomplish, achieve, and progress and contribute meaningfully to something that we care about. That mastery journey, whether it be your golf game or whether it be learning a craft or playing the banjo or simply doing our clinical work really, really well for, for sur a surgeon that may <laughs> be here, you know, imagine a case that goes fantastic. The team is humming, the anatomy is clear, everything is as planned, and what that feels like just to just to do something really, really well, close up and go, this that patient's gonna do great. And what it's like when a when a vessel is nicked, the anatomy is goofed up, there's just terrible prep. There's you know, the team is in, I mean. <laughs> Mastery is a driver of human contentment and building mastery culture is key. The second is authenticity, meaning I am who I know I should be. I'm living in accordance with my deepest held beliefs and our ability to live in accordance with what we aspire to be. And again, my first question whenever I coach clinicians is tell me about the clinician that you want to become because that is the target for the work that we do. I'm simply here to help you become that. And, and we allow clinicians to be their best and, and to be what they envision for themselves, that authenticity, I am being who I know I should be. And we can also say that living out of accordance with that, meaning this is what I know I should be doing and this is what I'm actually doing. And that dissonance and that delta is often a source of depression. And the third is belonging. Um, the human condition is not designed to be on its own. And our ability to create a place where people care about each other, look out for each other, uh, check in on one another, and they're friends with one another. And, and the human condition desperately needs that. So as we think about how do we build teams, uh, we have to think about mastery and learning and applying and mastering the skills of being a, a really great teammate. And the second is authenticity. What kind of team do we want to be? What does it mean to be a part of this team? 
let's write down what it means to be our team and let's go do that. And we'll live in accordance with that. And, and third is belonging. Let's build a place that looks out for one another. Uh, and what are the things that we can do? So that that's a little bit of, of, of a reflection. So we're going to start uh, with a little breakout. And, and what we're going to do is I, um, I create uh, an opportunity to, uh, for you guys to work together. So I'm going to create breakout rooms and I'm going to give you just, you know, six, seven minutes. And what I want you to think about uh, as, we, as we talk about four things that are present in teams is I want you to reflect on your best team experience. It can be in or out of healthcare. Something where you said, man, that was an amazing moment of my life. It could be the drum line in the band, the baseball team or debate team or your intern year, whatever it may be in or out of healthcare, your best team experience. And I want you to think about uh, in your groups, what are the common themes that you saw in those experiences? Um, so we had two groups. Uh, anybody want to share um, with their spokesperson or anybody else? We've got a small enough group to where we can, we can all share. Um, uh, wh what did you come up with? So our group, I guess we were room two. Um, we, um, uh, Geetha shared a story about uh, the, nur the nursing home where she works and um, about how you don't get the information um, from the discharge summary when you when the person is coming and then you get to know them she gets to know them um, and in terms of a, of the team um, it came up that when the team is informed about who the person actually is um, it's the team functions um, better and more um, humanely and more warmly, and it's a lot more satisfying. So Geetha, Elizabeth, um, Scott, um, Anna, anybody else have anything, Jermaine, that you want to add to that? Others? OK. Uh, this is room one. Uh, we had um, a, few, a, a, a few points that people share. And that's, um, there seems to be a theme of a mission. Um, if they, people, everyone is passionate about patient care, that seems to draw the team to connect uh, with each other and to build relationships. That's, uh, that's uh, Barb's um, team experience. Um, there was one from a group for a volunteer to go to Puerto Rico, a diverse group of providers and do a three-day pop-up clinic but they focus on providing um, excellent care. And so that kept the team together. And uh, Susan um, talked about um, a, a workflow that the team agreed on. Uh, for example, if someone who is out of the clinic, the agreement among the team is that um, when they come back, the in-basket has to be cleaned, <laughs> completely clean. Um, so that's the agreement uh, for, from the team and they live by it and it works so much better. Uh, Darlene uh, mentioned about uh, leadership, uh, how important is leadership to, uh, to keep them to, to be good for the team. And again, mission, um, the team's mission is important in a, a good team. No, it is. And I would you know, challenge you to think uh, about what it's like to operate like that um, and what it feels like going into work, coming home from work uh, and just delivering care and just the general experience of what it's like to be a care team member when the team is humming. Um, you know, there was an interesting study that was done and, and Susan has heard me tell this story, but there is a group of uh, interesting study that was done at a Washington University a number of years ago where they were looking at, uh, at the end of the residency for the ear, nose and throat surgeons, uh, the attending surgeons rated certain surgeons uh, by how they were on some basic core capabilities, how they were in the operating room, how they were with patients, how they were with colleagues, how they were with team, team members, and this kind of composite of great clinicians. And they went back in time to identify what is it about them that could have predicted them becoming the great surgeons that they later became. And they looked at board scores and interview performance and training and background and age and demographics, all these things. And they none of them really correlated with 
what later became great clinicians according to these attendings by these criteria. Uh, but there was one standout variable that was more predictive than, than any other. And that one thing was participation in a competitive team sport. And, uh, and they even looked at individual sports like golf and swimming, and those didn't pan out. Uh, and it wasn't that you have to be an athlete to be a clinician. That was not the point. The point is, is that highly competitive teams who perform at a high level are of the disposition that the work that we do is bigger than any one of us. And they operate and they communicate and they give cues that the work that we do is bigger than us. And, and so our ability by which to understand that, that that's what great team leaders do. Uh, they will unite around a common cause and they will deploy actions that allow the people that are in their team to, to become really, really good at their work and to love doing their work and to feel valued and appreciated uh, in their work. So, you know, th these are, you know, some interesting things. And what I would encourage you is that just like uh, patient connection, team collaboration and leadership are big drivers of, I love my life as a clinician or not. Uh, this is about what it's like to be part of a great team uh, and what that, what that feels like. So we talk a little bit about four things that we see. These are, again, these are, these are kind of biopsies of, of things that we see in regards to uh, great teams. Uh, and uh, this is, a lot of this is subjective, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's transcendent to families. Um, I think it's transcendent to friends. Uh, and certainly as a clinical microsystem team leader, and as an organizational uh, leader, uh, executive leader, uh, and what we do. Um, and action number one is kindness to each other. Kindness is a profoundly contagious behavior. There, there was a time, it was not last Thanksgiving, but the Thanksgiving before, where uh, I was standing in line and uh, checking out at a grocery store. And you know, they, you have a chance to be able to sort of uh, donate. They say, do you want to donate one, five or $10 uh, to, you know, uh, kind of the, the food bank to make sure people in our community have food. So I said, no, you can just $10 is great. So, um, and the checker went, well, that's great. Thank you very much. And, and then they have a little bell they ring when they do the $10 ding ding. And the next person, as I was, did $10. And then I watched that, ent that entire line did $10 because the act of kindness changes what people do for one another. It's a, it's a contagion of sorts. So witnessable kindness, things that say we are kind to one another. Number one, we know each other. You know, we, we know each other's names. We call each other by our names. We check in on one another. We, we, we text each other. And particularly now where we, uh, we, you know, we, I just, I was thinking about you or how you're holding up uh, in this craziness. You pitch in if someone's overwhelmed. You you keep your eyes wide open, saying, "This is I got my work done." <laughs> you you dive in to say, "Hey, man, it looks like you're struggling. Can I give you some help?" Uh, recognition uh, that is specific and authentic. Recognizing people uh, for for what they do and, and calling them out. Doing fun things together. Having a a, a, a pedometer, uh, uh, you know, step competition or a fantasy football league or a Texas Hold'em party or when we used to do things like that uh, and celebrating birthdays, you know, it's, uh, I think that's a cultural proxy, you know, for simple things that we can do to advance the kindness uh, of our teams. Number two is uh, high approachability. Um, approachability is fundamental to delivering safe care and clinicians are at the top of the power pyramid uh, and our ability to dismantle and reduce authority gradients is key to our ability to deliver high performing teams. Um, and we, uh, we reduce authority, we, uh, we, we tap suggestions um, to say to the frontline receptionist, you know, you guys have got a pretty good angle on how we can keep better patients, patients better informed at wait times. What are your best ideas that we can, that we can take a look at? So you're, you're tapping ideas and everybody can contribute. And when you get ideas, it's not like, I'm the, I'm the MD here. You, you little minions listen to what I have to say, but this is, you know, I want, I want to have a deference to your positions and what your experience is and your knowledge based upon your perspective. I would love to hear your take on this. Uh, deference, deference to frontline is a high reliability principle 
you defer to the people who actually know, who are actually doing the work. And what we call becoming a multiplying leader, meaning you tap your team for their ideas, you sponsor those ideas, and you rely on principles of crowdsourcing and team intelligence to make the team smart. And you pay forward the ideas that you're able to harvest. Um, and so people say, does your voice count at work? Heck yeah, man. They're like asking me for my ideas. And then they and then they announced me at the meeting that I came up with the idea. Then they figured out how they can sponsor it to be able to get it into one of our action plans at our meetings. It was, you know, it's amazing here. I love, I love this group and I love how I'm treated um, that my voice is heard. Uh, and, and, and number three is bigger than us. You know, we're serving something bigger than us. Um, our mission is bigger than us. Every person has a desire to make a difference in the world. Uh, and people that are able to do it, and it's that's profoundly accessible in healthcare. I should be. <laughs> so un unifying around what's best for patients. And we have found in our research that when clinicians feel as though they are in an environment that is truly and authentically dedicated to what's best and right for patients, their probability of burnout is four times lower than clinicians who feel like an RVU center. And so our ability to serve a higher calling. That's why people who are doing mission work and they come back from, you know, you know, Uganda from a medical mission and they go, that was the best week of my life. And they made no money <laughs> and they, and, and, you know, slept in a sleeping bag is because we, we have this need to be able to make uh, an impact in building a team that says that becomes a storytelling organization about what they are cues as to why we are here remember why we're here storytelling of the patients that you that you take care of reflecting on the good things writing down the good things before you go to bed at night three good things is more powerful than an ssri in terms of relieving depression and retraining your brain to look for good things in bed storytelling into every single meeting uh, meaning story time, make a story time agenda, the impact that we're making in the lives of patients, recognition of those that are going above and beyond and calling them out and, and thinking and reflecting and what is our best team experience? What's my best leader experience? What is my best clinician experience? And use that as an exercise and, and our ability to get that done. Action four is learning. Uh, as I said, mastery. You know, we talk about all these things that make for great teams. They don't just spontaneously happen. We have to develop the skills to allow that to manifest. So we as clinicians know how to reduce authority gradients. We as clinicians know how to tap the ideas of others. We as clinicians know how to encourage other people. We as clinicians know how to uh, appreciate other people. That don't You can't just say that's gonna happen. We have to have a deliberate learning strategy so clinicians can learn uh, and continue to improve not only patient connectivity skills, but our ability to lead our teams, to learn skills, to allow those things to happen, applying skills learned, because learning skills is not enough. It's applying skills so we can get results. We learn on our own, meaning, you know, reading books and, you know, some of the work that we do with the Clinician Experience Project, we coach and train using micro learning to advance skills, to create outcomes for clinicians to be better and for patients to say, you guys are better. Gathering feedback uh, and tracking progress on are we doing it? Uh, that's the voice of the patients. I mean, we people say patient experience is the voice of the, those that we serve saying, are we doing the things that we're committed to? And, and to exchange approaches and to be able to have, you know, how do you build confidence in the eyes of patients and giving clinicians a chance to exchange their ideas and have a skill building forum built within meetings like this to say, how do we best manage a patient that's demanding a medically unnecessary test? How do you approach it? And then allow this skill exchange to, to occur, to allow clinicians to learn from, from one another. And finally, lastly, last call to action, and uh, I'll field some question, you know, really just deciding who you want to be as a leader and as a clinician, and just take action to be that person. Um, it, it sounds stupidly simple, <laughs> but we have full control over that, over that cycle. And, and with that, uh, that is, that is it. I, and I, I want to be able to certainly provide my contact information. So if there's curiosities or questions or clarifications, um, it's pretty insanely crazy busy right now, <laughs> um, but I, I try to get back with, uh, uh, with emails. But uh, those are some notions and experiences of amazing teams. They're kind, they learn, they serve a higher 
mission and calling, and they are immensely approachable to one another. And, and they, they love each other, man. And they go, man, I, I love my teammates. They're, they're awesome. And we can, we can do anything, even when work is super hard, if we're operating on this DNA. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left and, and happy to, to field anything, curiosities or experiences and anything from your angle. I have a question, Steve. First of all, thank you for this really wonderful talk. It, I love the drivers of contentment. I think if we focus on that for ourselves, it will really help our own burnouts. Um, yeah. I'm anxious to review that again. But I was wondering, sometimes you get on a team and there's someone on the team that is just not really in sync um, for whatever reason they have. They're, they're not showing any kindness or willingness and you don't know what their passion is. How do you deal with, or how do you approach a difficult team member who doesn't seem to be on the same page? That's a great question. And almost everybody in the, a team of four or five, what we call a clinical microsystem, may have somebody like that with a reasonable probability. And what I would encourage uh, as I think about this, um, and this has been a real evolution of me as a leader, is it's pretty simple to think, this is what it means to be a good teammate. Could you please be that and not just suck the oxygen out of the room every time you step into it? Um, on the assumption, and this is a bias on our part, that they're just a problem player. Uh, and, and we have to de determine, is it a teammate that is a problem or does the teammate have a problem? Uh, and so I, I, I think a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, um, you know, I'm noticing a few things. Is everything okay from your angle? And so you're bringing curiosity as over accusation. Uh, and sometimes you find out, holy smokes, I, you're going through divorce. Um, they found crack in your kid's dorm room and he got kicked out of college and you're declaring bankruptcy. Uh, I cannot even imagine uh, what this must be like for you right now. And you know that's, that's a different conversation than somebody who's just a bad apple. And so, and often people without personality disorders, if you simply objectively say, here's what I'm observing and here's the impact that it's having, is everything okay? And objectively convey, not, not fix it, but this is what I'm seeing and this is what the team is feeling as a result. Is everything okay? Because this is different for you. Uh, Jerry Hickson's data from Vanderbilt that about 80, 85% of clinicians that are approached with this conversation become immensely aware of their impact on others because we assume self-awareness. How could they not know? But they, they may not, I can assure you. 85% of people believe that they're self-aware, but only about 10% actually are. So um, I would just bring curiosity over accusation. I, uh, and if it needs to have the next conversation, which is, this is what it means to be a, a teammate, a great teammate, or you can ask them, um, how you, how do you define a great teammate? What does it mean to be a great teammate in your eyes? And, and then they'll, they'll say what we want them to say. Then we'll say, I'm going to help you become that. So, uh, th those are just some interventions that, that can help. What is a very common issue? There's, um, Another question in the chat from Dr. Defendi. Um, how do you address differences in the clinical workplace in regard to gender as in addressing a woman's role in today's society uh, as a mom, home caregiver, and career? Um, any ideas on how to help keep a balance in a working environment? Yeah, no, I know it's, it, it's a great question. And in fact, I've got a, uh, a podcast coming up with um, her name is Kanuki. And I don't I can't remember her last name, but she's uh, heading up the movement of uh, women in medicine and speaking about these issues. And um, I, I can't speak to that directly, but what I can tell you is that in our medical group that is over 50% women in terms of practicing clinicians, if you do not have uh, flexibility and support, um, regardless of whatever gender it is regarding the demands of being a member of a household, 
you're not going to be able to recruit clinicians. And, and so the, the ability to recognize the need to, to have a lot of responsibilities even out of the household, and that can be flexible work hours, it can be um, part-time support uh, for whatever gender, to provide flexibility to be able to have a life outside of your 1.0 FTE being a clinician. And, and groups that are recruiting great talent are providing that. And if you don't, you're 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 not because the current generation of young clinicians are saying, "I got a life, and I want to find a place that allows me to live it, male or female." That's probably not very helpful, but. <laughs> Thank you. And then from Susan Leggett Johnson, how do you remind yourself as a leader to continue to use these practices during busy times? Well, um, I think that you. you we have to commit as a leadership team together because it is really easy to slide back on your own. Um, and, and to have a group of leaders that commit to a pact of what it means to be a leader here, uh, to include learning journal clubs, to create awareness. So we're always reminding, we need to encourage others. We need to encourage others. We need to, you know, we need to appreciate others. We need to you know, walk what we talk, we need to convey our intentions about an activity. We, you know, these are, these are just basic building blocks of effective leadership. And, you know, I, I think the idea of committing 1% of your work hours to learning, uh, that's about five, five or 10 minutes a day. Uh, I think uh, creating a cohort that is learning and doing things together. So they're supporting one another, reminding each other and mentoring each other and calling each other out. I, can, can help. And I think embedding into meeting structures, things like uh, call outs and recognizing people, story time, or uh, learning of the week, um, you know, teaching people other things that are important on how we treat patients, how we treat each other is probably the second most powerful learning mechanism, first being actually applying it. So, so those are, those are some hooks to do. So we're able to sustain these things but knowing that it's super hard to sustain these things. The world towards, tends towards anarchy or entropy, uh, not anarchy, entropy. <laughs> I said, that didn't sound right. Entropy. Right? Maybe that too. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions from anyone? You can take yourself off of mute and feel free to speak up or if you want to type something into the chat. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I will uh, say it, uh, I, I don't type very fast in my iPad and my French speaking could be distorted. So sorry about that. So uh, Stephen, in our hospital, and I mentioned that to you a little bit earlier, we, um, we were doing the practice excellence and, and this was amazing. First of all, thank you for all your work that you've done. I've realized by my own experience and you've discussed that a little bit earlier, how important it is the, the individual build their own story yeah. and their, their, their values and, and this affect them and, and they live with this old image. Yeah. So this is a little bit the reason me, I went into a, a, a coaching model because I said that people, it's not so much counseling. We're gonna be able to be there present with them and coach them so that they can understand how much it blocks them right. with this old image. Can you talk a little, I'm sure yeah. you've done work into yeah, this. Yeah, no, it is. It, 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 you know, defining who we wanna become and actually writing it down and sharing it with somebody you really trust. Sharing. And, and it's not even healthcare. It says, I wanna, I wanna care for myself so I can be around for my family. I said, well, let, let's craft a, 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 an approach to allow you to manifest that. I want to be a great mom or dad and spend time with my kids on a daily basis. Well, let's, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a basic thing that I want. And I want to make an impact in each and every patient that I see. It's a great, I'm going to, I'm going to help you with that. And so they craft the destination, just like the patient says, what I want to do as a patient is much better than us telling them what they need to go do. And, and so allowing them to craft in the spirit of self-awareness, who will I be? Who do I seek to become? What are my deepest held beliefs? Might do this and don't do this in life. And I'm going to write it down on a half piece of paper and I'm going to post it and share it 
uh, and commit myself to it. Um, and, and, and again, we achieve those things, whatever they may be, you say, I did it. And just what it feels like, that's why running, you know, fitness feels so good. It's not, it's just that I did what I knew that I should. That, that, that's a great driver of, of contentment. And, and, and a coach is like an enzyme and a catalyst to allow us to do what we know we should. Prompt reminder coach. Thank you. Sure. All right. I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, any, clinic, right? <laughs> <laughs> any final, any final questions? And I just want to say thank you, Stephen, for the, one, uh, the wonderful talk. Um, I think this, um, I hope that a lot of uh, providers will get a chance to tune in to this uh, recording. Um, yes. Thank you. We'll, we'll do a little trimming on our end. We've got very good video editors over here. So we'll, uh, we'll get it tight and cleaned up, get some bumpers on it and get it sent out to you. Thank you. That's All right. great. Well, thank, thank you so much. much. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so Thank much, you. Steve. Take care. We'll see you much soon. Happy Yes, you too.